Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Interreg Central Europe Programme Conference. My name is Frank Schneider and I'm pleased to be your host today, throughout the day, together with my colleague Dana Kashakova. Good morning, Central Europe. Good morning also from my side. We are very, very happy to organize a part of the event also on site because we have been in Pure Online for a few years now. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here. It's more than 170 people gathering here in Vienna. You are project partners, lead partners, program stakeholders, but also other Interreg allies, and we are very happy that you join us today. My special welcome also goes to everyone online. So our community is actually much bigger because we have uh, more than 800 registration for the live stream. So uh, thank you for your big interest. Thank you, Dana. Let's have a quick look maybe at what is planned for today. So this morning, we will start with the discussion of the achievements and also the future perspectives of cohesion policy and territorial cooperation. We will also hear about the first call. Where do we actually stand after we closed it one year ago? And many of you are actually part of the 53 projects that we are financing now. Building on that very positive experience, I have to say, we will also launch our second call for proposers today, together with you. But that's actually not yet all, Dana. Indeed, in the afternoon, we have uh, more to offer to you, especially because we will have 10 thematic roundtables where you can meet with your peer projects. You can also meet with other people dealing with the same topics in the thematic fields. And uh, these uh, thematic roundtables are unfortunately not for online, but again, the community connecting through applicant community, actually, uh, you have also um, more to actually explore because there are dozens of projects ideas already on the platform. There is more than 1,200 people now connecting uh, via the community, so you can make use of it. As you can see, there's a lot ahead of us. Um, just a brief uh, hint that you can also participate in the conference today. Those in the room, you can just raise your hands later in the discussions, that's easy. But for all others, we also have Slido in the community, in the live stream, hello. <laughs> so just use the hashtag cooperation is central. Uh, when you go to slido.com, um, if you want to post anything on social media, feel free to use also Cooperation is Central so that we will see how you like our event, what information you're gathering here. And yeah, we are happy to hear from you very soon. But before we start with this, I have to say it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome Mr. Roland Arpter, the Deputy Director for the Coordination of Regional Policy and Spatial Planning at the Austrian Federal Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, Regions, and water management. Roland, the floor is yours for a welcome address. Thank you, Frank. Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Vienna, to this conference of the Interreg Program Central Europe. Welcome, colleagues. Um, as said, today's conference is organized as a hybrid event, so I start by welcoming the participants who are attending uh, via live stream. Uh, they are the majority, as we heard, nearly eight, nine hundred have been registered all over Europe and in particu particular um, in the Central Europe space. Quite an impressive outreach and quite also, a, I think, a good format to go for a hybrid form format. And of course, I welcome you here in Vienna, face to face, uh, physically. Um, nearly 200 persons um, participating the whole day um, in the morning and also in the workshops in the afternoon. Obviously, there is an interest to meet again physically after the post pandemic, -pandemic uh, time. And hopefully, you will take a lot of energy also um, for your work uh, back home, um, wherever you are active in cooperation. Um, among all, I want to welcome um, our keynote speakers and special guests. First of all, Mr. Shime Erlich, the Minister of Regional De Development and EU Funds of the Republic of Croatia. Um, 
very welcome and thank you for attending and also showing the politically the high level interest in the activities of the program. Uh, I want to welcome Mr. Slavomir Tokarski from the European Commission, more or less the highest civil servant on Interreg in, in Europe, um, and uh, Karolina Jasinska, who is following the program, the Central Europe program, um, as a desk officer, but as a good colleague of the, uh, in the program. I also particularly welcome what will be introduced later, the keynote spe speakers, um, Kai Böhme from Special Foresight from Luxembourg, outside the space, but very much linked with the space, Professor Francesca Campomori from Venice, and Frantisek Kubesch from Brno. Um, yes, I don't name all the other uh, distinguished guests. Uh, welcome, all of you. Um, I've been introduced, nevertheless, you will ask yourself why is it me? Why is it the ministry opening um, the, the conference? Um, we are, I'm, we are more or less together with my colleague Alexander Daimel, who is working in a program representing Austria in the cooperation on Central Europe program. But we are not uh, doing the bulk of the work. So the, 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 the work and the gratitude for organizing the event is with the city of Vienna. Uh, with the unit in the city of Vienna of Director Martin Pospischel and uh, Christiane Bresnik as the head of the managing authority and her team and uh, Luca Ferrarese in the joint secretariat with, with the team. So the gratitude is uh, with them to have organized uh, this event. Um, speaking here for the introduction, I, I go a little bit beyond the welcoming, also speaking as, as an Austrian institution and giving some maybe also appetizers for, for the discussion after, uh, what, after uh, uh, what, uh, from the perspective of a national authority being in charge for Interreg, but also for transnational programs. And as you know, we are not also only following this program, but also the Alpine Space and the Danube pro program. We are also following the macro regional strategies in the Alpine area and the Danube area. So we have some collected some experience and perspective on cooperation in, 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 in larger areas. Um, and um, looking at Central, the Central Europe uh, cooperation and the program, for us it's a very special program um, in a very special geographic area, um, meeting uh, quite flexibly the needs of and the potentials of um, this area uh, during changing times, and we are in special times. And just let me explain briefly what I mean. Um, very practically, the, the Central Europe program is for us one of the best performing programs without any benchmarking, but, but the program has delivered quite impressively um, more than 10 years in, in, in running program, quite complex programs, projects, and so, and so on. And um, even today, we are in the situation also to get information about first call uh, results and getting uh, already information on the second call. So the program is one of the, a good, a good practice, I don't say a best practice, I say a good practice in Europe for, for cooperation. Um, and as concerns the, the responsibility, I mentioned the role of the city of Vienna for us in Austria, it's quite normal that as a subnational authority, cities even take responsibilities, not only on project level, but also on program level. But nevertheless, I think it should be mentioned and highlighted that this program is managed by a city, by a region. Um, so uh, a city, a subnational authority, being committed to take over responsibility. And this is, as most of you know, Vienna not, for Vienna not a single case, but Vienna has taken over uh, several European responsibilities in different programs, but also in the macro region strategy, hosting the Danube strategy point, uh, uh, working as priority coordinators, and many other tasks also on cross-border pro uh, programs. I think this is also something worth to mention, that those programs are not only uh, are for subnational authorities, not only on the project level, but also as concerns the responsibility. Um, my third point, um, why I think this program is special is that it's, um, when, when I look back and I, I, I'm getting older, so I, my first experience is more than 25 years old with this space. We started by stimulating cooperation across not the Iron Curtain, but, but uh, immediately after the fall of the Iron Curtain with non-member countries without EU funds. So this was the first phase and then it, it gradually developed and now we're in the situation that nine member states are cooperating in Central Europe. So it's, it's uh, getting more and more European and I think the program 
is somehow a very flexible and agile answer on the needs and also of the evolution of the geopolitical situation, also the needs in the area. And I would say also in, re in reference to the, to the, to the uh, title of the conference and the first session, the journey is not over with this period, but will, it will continue uh, in geographic terms, uh, the area becoming more and more the center of Europe, as some people think, <laughs> and also on these north-south relations, which have been in the past at least not the priority, it was, was more east-west, and now it's north-south. So the journey is not over for this um, uh, program, and um, the flexibility to adapt to the needs is there. My last point, why this is special, the program, is that um, from our perspective, in this program, but also in other programs, um, the, the actors uh, at all levels um, try or, or make efforts to go beyond using the program as a funding scheme. It's not only about money and funding projects. It's about stimulating, supporting cooperation as a system. So I think this program is a good example and also the agenda today and the, also the discussion as I heard yesterday in the monitoring committee that to discuss about project types, um, uh, project partners, um, scaling up, um, linking into EU agendas, cooperation with Horizon and other, other EU policies. Um, so this not working in a silo and not working as, as, a, as a financing tool only, but, but, to, but to use the program for a, 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 a bigger purpose on, on cooperation. I think this is a good example. So, but I will not be much longer. I come to the end. The agenda has been already um, uh, introduced. I just want to refer to the agenda. I think in the agenda, you, we will find today these building blocks, strategic discussion. We find the, the practical things for, on, on projects and, 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 and the outlook on the second call. And we also find this networking, community building, linking with other actors. I think this is well covered as a, as a next, as an incentive uh, to experience today, but also to go uh, further and along this line. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much, Roland. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roland, for this introduction and this brief welcome. You said in many, uh, important things about why we are cooperating, but somehow I'm going to remember that we're not a best practice, but a good practice. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, before I look uh, forward to hearing more from you very soon, you will also be with us in the panel discussion. Uh, before I continue with this, uh, it is my great honor now to introduce our next speaker. We will hear from him how cohesion policy and transnational cooperation are helping to transform Croatia. Croatia became a member of the European Union 10 years ago, as we know. So it is my great honor to welcome Mr. Shima Erlic, Minister of Regional Development and EU Funds in the Republic of Croatia. Welcome, Minister Erlic. <laughs> Well, good day and good morning, uh, everybody. It's my great pleasure to be here in Vienna once again, and on this occasion, especially after years of COVID struggling and not being able to socialize, socialize like this. So I'm very happy to be here today with you, and, and especially again uh, on occasion of Central Europe Conference uh, that has put into the center of the discussion two very important themes and I would say very important European goals and that is the cohesion policy and the European territorial cooperation. So it is my pleasure to address you today on the, important, on the importance of the cohesion policy in achieving a green and digital transformation with help of territorial cooperation uh, as well as our strategic outlooks of the future. Uh, from the perspective of the Republic of uh, Croatia, as uh, Frank said, I will try to be uh, brief in trying to explain the example of Croatia because I think that Croatia really is one of the great examples of what cohesion can uh, achieve uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a country 
that has been uh, in a, a member state for such a short while. Uh, so the Croatia is celebrating 10 years in the uh, European Union uh, this year, and one of the greatest achievements of Croatian membership is for certain cohesion policy that has brought many significant uh, benefits for Croatia. Uh, despite being the youngest member state, Croatia is among the most active regarding the amount of available and absorbed funding in relation to the national budget. And cohesion policy results in Croatia are so much tangible that practically there is no area in Croatia there hasn't been some kind of investment from the co cohesion po policy or that hasn't been taking place somewhere. And uh, it, it can, you can feel the investments from the cohesion policy and development uh, all across the country. And one of the maybe prime examples of those successful cohesion investments, which tremendously con contributed to our territorial but also co uh, cohesion but also economic development, is for certain our Pelishats Bridge that has helped us to connect the Croatia as a, as a whole, but also helped us to connect uh, Europe as a whole. Um, many projects have been delivered in Croatia uh, to the past 10 years and uh, to highlight how important co cohesion policy for Croatia it shows one figure that says that more than 70% of all public investments in Croatia comes from the cohesion policy. It's a huge, we know that, and therefore it has a significant influence on our economic growth. So. Uh, to be even more precise about the Croatian convergence achievement, I would say that Croatia, when entered the European Union, was at uh, approximately 60% of the European GDP, average GDP. And today, while we are talking here, Croatian GDP is more than 70% of the European um, uh, uh, GDP average. So the proof is there. Cohesion really works in practice. practice Croatia is catching up. And those are the great results that has been delivered to the cohesion. Um, and we have to have in mind that this is all happening to a country that experienced only one full financial perspective. So far, and faced pandemic crisis, we faced also two devastating earthquakes. And of course, as whole Europe and world, we are experiencing the effects, negative effects of war in Ukraine and shocks on global market. Uh, however, those are the good things, but however, the, the still great challenges are ahead of us. Development disparities between the regions in Croatia are still high. We are still struggling to engage the potentials of the less developed regions and to address especially the demographic challenges. So the question arises right now for us, but I think also for the whole Europe, is how can we adjust cohesion policy to tackle these challenges in the next decade? And can we focus more our territorial cooperation into the engagement of the region potentials? I think this is crucial. Great opportunity lies in innovation, green and digital transition, and the transition to non-carbon, uh, to carbon neutrality. But me, in my humble opinion, uh, the desired change will lack if there should not be transition goals connected to concrete regional potentials with clear territorial focus. So with that in mind, in Croatia, we de developed the cohesion progress architecture in a way that takes into account both national as well as regional and local perspectives. Through strengthening the industrial transition of regions, together with other prioritized investments focused on development sustainable cities and islands, together with specially designed territorial instruments focused on interventions towards hilly mountainous and assisted areas, we would like to achieve greater usage of these regions' potentials with our main goal, which is strong but balanced regional development of their entire territory. Therefore, by integration of the development priorities of municipalities, cities, counties, with corresponding national priorities, and achieving one of our primary goals to ensure the decisions are taken closely to the ground, as we like to say, and consider real needs of all regions, we try to improve overall and balanced development of all parts of Croatia. Uh, to successfully bridge these challenges and address common 
uh, concerns European territorial cooperation programs could really play a key role as a generator of a cohesion policy funds. First of all, um, European territorial cooperation programs are facilitating the exchange of best practices, as we have heard, <laughs> and promote cooperations among regions. Uh, second, they're helping to identify common challenges and opportunities that cu cut across the regions. And that is particularly important, how to engage region potentials and how to engage regions into the cooperation, which can encourage design of more eff effective cohesion policy interventions in future. So there is a strong case for even stronger territorial cooperation in future. This is my opinion. And because post-27 Interreg framework will, will need to adapt even more to a new challenges and opportunities. Key focus must be on strengthening the resilience of the regions and communities, particularly in terms of the energy crisis, climate change, and other external shocks. But to address all of these uh, challenges uh, will require evidence-based, sound investment policies supported by greater cooperation across, across the border and across the regions. So as we look towards the future, territorial cooperation will be crucial, not just for Croatia, but I will say for whole Europe, to navigate the challenges that lay ahead of us. And we believe that such cooperation will enable us to overcome all the challenges that are ahead of us and to foster spirit of collaboration because cooperation is central for all, all of us. This is what I believe all of the participants of two, today's conference strongly believe. So, as you can see, we are expecting a lot from new perspective, from new financial perspective of the European Union, but also from the territorial cooperation and cohesion policy. And it is expected that the new perspective will have even bigger positive impact of the, uh, on the regions across the EU, but we cannot wait for the results to be seen. It is already necessary to join forces to ensure the strong cohesion policy remains into the future. This is why I'm especially pleased that the Commission also sees this, the, this problem in the same way and that, um, uh, 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 that in, involves the Member States uh, and asking for contribution on views and, and, and ideas on future policy and future of the cohesion policy. We support and look forward to debating on the future of cohesion policy 27. And I can, say for, uh, I can say for the Croatian side that we have the future of cohesion policy high on our priority list. And we firmly believe that it is symbolized the foundation of the European project and do, uh, should stay committed uh, to its original goals of contribution to economic, social, and territorial uh, cohesion of the EU. Uh, cohesion policy was and still is the European Commission's main investment tool, reaching the third of the European Union's budget, and in our opinion, it should stay that way or even be strengthened in future. So we are living in most uncertain time ever, and during the last years, cohesion policy were focused mainly on crisis management uh, more than ever before. So that brought stability to a member state's budget, that brought stability to a member state's growth, but making the cohesion policy only a uh, crisis mechanism tool is not to be the rule as such actions are moving us towards the long-term cohesion uh, goals and I think this is crucial to understand. In spite of the fact that cohesion policy has provided to be flexible and able to respond to the crisis situation, uh, it should not be the crisis instrument and it should be able to respond to new development without disrupting its long-term goals. Therefore, I see this conference from our greatest interest and as a contribution on discussion on the future of the cohesion policy. And I really strongly believe that today's discussion and conclusion will help to shape the ideas on how to design the future of the cohesion using the benefits of the territorial cooperation. So thank you and I wish looking forward for interesting day to day, interesting conference here in Vienna. Thank, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Minister Ehrlich, for making such a strong case to think cohesion policy beyond crisis response and for pointing out how it really helps uh, Croatia to transform Croatia in view of the green and digital transitions. Um, what I want to add maybe is you emphasize the catching up, how much it helps Croatia to catch up. I think the nice thing about Interreg Central Europe is Croatia doesn't need to catch up. We have many, many Croatian partners already in our projects. We have many lead partners, we have many project partners. Many of them are around. You will meet many of them, I guess, today. So thank you very much again for making uh, this, uh, giving this keynote speech. Our next speaker will now take a look into the future of cooperation and cohesion policy. Some of you might know the political discussions have started already. It's only 2023. We are talking about the period beyond 2027, but Political discussions have to start early if we want to get funding after 2027. So it is my great honor to hear an input from Kai Böhme, expert for European regional and territorial research and policies at Spatial Foresight, who will give us his view on where cohesion policy and territory cooperation might be heading. Welcome, Kai. Good morning. Thank you, Frank, for the nice introduction. Minister, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure being here. And the task I got was a little bit a large one. So I want to say a few words about where we see the point of departure for possible changes and which kind of possible futures we can imagine if we think a little bit beyond what we would like to see, but what might be there if we like it or not. So if we start with the point of departure. I think a lot of things have already been mentioned by the minister and by Roland Arpter, saying we live in a time, or Roland used that kind of, of changing times, very special times. And a few points that are important for me, and that is, on the one hand, if you look into the future, we see a lot of financial constraints. As over the last years, with COVID, with the energy crisis, the war in Ukraine, and all those things, public budgets have spent a lot of money which means there is probably less to distribute in future. So we need to take that into account when we think about the future. We also live in a time of permanent crisis in a way, as be it COVID, be it the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis, the migration issue that comes with the energy crisis, inflation, not to forget climate change, loss of biodiversity. So we are living in a time that somehow puts one crisis at the top of the other, and we also live in a time of transitions. And Minister, you mentioned that the green and the digital transition is really important if we want to master climate change and the challenges that come with that, if we want to master the digitalization of our society or economy. And you also mentioned demographic change. So we also living in a time of a demographic transition, and not only in Croatia, basically all of Europe are going through dramatic demographic transitions. And if you put all that together, as the financial perspectives, the different types of crises, the different types of transitions, they all play out territorially, in space. And they all, in one way or the other, have a tendency to make inequalities between people, but also between places becoming wider. So we see an enormous risk of all that, not necessarily leading to cohesion, but needing to a uh, need to act for more cohesion. And that requires a number of capacities in order to do that. So it's not that we just kind of say, okay, we have the recipe. But it, the magnitude of those changes basically implies that we all need to punch above our own weight. So we need to go stronger and become stronger than what we are today already. It also means we need to become much better in navigating under uncertainty. It's not that we can say today what will be tomorrow. It's not that we have the evidence to get the best decision. We have much more uncertainty around. But we also need to become extremely good in mobilizing, mobilizing people, players, stakeholders, whatever you want to call it, to become active. And I think Central Europe is a great example of a way to mobilize players throughout the territory, but also mobilizing resources, be it financial resources, be it other types of resources. So we really need to see what can be done. And of course, that is not done only here for me at my level. That requires a multi-level governance dimension where different levels of decision-making, different sectors come together, and for that to work out. 
in that uncertainty, in that mobilizing, mobilization phase, we need to have a sense of direction. Also, we need to have a shared idea roughly where we want to go to. Otherwise, it will be very difficult. I call it a vision, that it might be a strong word, but I think a shared sense of direction, what future we want, is actually very helpful. And if you put that together, basically it's asking for extremely good governance. And I think that's a little bit where I say, okay, that's where we start at the moment. That's where we need to act. And then we work a lot with foresight and looking into possible futures. And in order to avoid that, we we'll just look into futures that are very past dependent and what we would like to see, we work quite a lot with different scenarios, scenarios we like, scenarios we don't like. So it's not about what we want, but what might be in the cards. And here are just three examples of possible scenarios for cohesion policy. So I hope it goes the way the minister just outlined, but if you look in the way what is there at the moment, they're also different ways. And I just picked three of the scenarios we were working with. The one we called a new era for cohesion policy. So that is basically a revamped cohesion policy. Saying cohesion policy has shown that it can be extremely powerful, both in meeting crisis, but also in supporting structural change. And saying if you put a stronger focus on resilience, on flexibility in cohesion policy, we actually can make a new era, a much more future-wise cohesion policy, which is terribly important for the transition, for policy integration, which is very agile and multi-stakeholder instruments where the shared management system really plays out, but we also learn some things from, from the Recovery and Resilience Fund of how to set priorities, how to measure and pay per achievement rather than looking at kind of have you followed all the rules. Just very quickly, one of the scenarios. Another scenario is more modest, I would say. It's about, we call it cohesion policy primus inter pares. So here we see what the tendencies that we had over the last years, that there are changes, and these changes require new policy reactions, and then we get a new policy instrument, a new policy to say, in order to meet such change, such crisis, we do something. And that means that we see a number of growing policy fields and instruments, and cohesion policy becomes more one of them, but then also follows what the minister just said, maybe isn't the tool for everything, but focuses on the structural issue. Also when I grew up, cohesion policy was called structural policies, and saying really not today, but what are the structural needs to make us fit for the future? And that way, cohesion policy becomes essential to making things hanging together, but it's working in an environment of many more policies with all the plus and minus that come when you have to negotiate with different policies and try to get that together. Then there is a third scenario, which probably most of you will hate me for, but which we labeled post-cohesion policy. And that's basically saying we see that tendency as in the other one of growing number of policies because every new need is met by a new instrument, by a new policy, and cohesion policy becoming very fundamental. And then cohesion policy has a few real principles. It's about accountability, multi-level governance, shared management, and so things which make cohesion policy in the eye of many people cumbersome and not very agile. So basically, by that, cohesion policy puts itself in the corner, and you get all the new, young, agile policies taking over, and then, oh yeah, your time is over. Thank you very much. So none of the three is likely to happen. The reality will be something in between those. That's just kind of three ways of thinking what future we might have. And they all three have different impacts on how we picture cohesion in Europe and how we work with cooperation. And I think in the first one, cooperation can be very essential. In the second one, the question is when we really look at the structural policies, how essential is co cooperation for the structural change and question of discussion. If we have no cohesion policy, how essential becomes cooperation for other types of policies? How do we do that? The same goes with cohesion. And as I have not endless time, I jump a little bit forward. And just saying, when we talk about cohesion, it's a nice word, we all use it very much, but when I talk to people, 
it's often very unclear what we actually mean. It, it's a nice concept, a piece of reference, and just kind of four images to pick four ideas, how people see it. Like in the top right of this, where you see kind of the changing things, um, here the focus is on mutual interdependencies. And then cohesion policy is actually understanding that we, as places, as persons, we are mutually dependent on each other. We are not islands. We are work, living in a world of interdependencies. If you take the top left, that's more cohesion as a way of saying, okay, the tides that lift all boats. So everybody gets something to grow, and then everybody is doing a little bit better wherever that takes us. If you take the center part, we say, okay, those areas that are maybe suffering a little bit more, a little bit more disadvantaged, they maybe get a little stronger, a little bit more support, and then those that are doing well. And that's a way of seeing cohesion. And then the top left, basically, we can also see cohesion as a way to change the system and saying, okay, maybe it's not kind of supporting those people, but it's maybe adjusting the system to things. All those ideas are around when you talk to people about cohesion. And then the question, for whom actually? For whom do we talk about that? Is it for people? Is it for regions? There are very many different dimensions. And in particular, if you think about the political perspectives, look at the debate about the pension systems in, in France, look at popular parties with kind of very anti-European sediments, we maybe need to think cohesion policy more about people and not about funny nuts regions that nobody really understands what they are if you're out on the street. But actually, we're talking about cohesion for people. And then the question is, what? Cohesion of what? The minister just mentioned kind of GDP, which is the measure officially used. We had in Brexit huge discussions about my GDP or your GDP. Very, very abstract again. Maybe we need to think what we really want. Is it about well-being? Is it about quality of life? Is it is about future prospects. Getting more nuanced what we want in co getting out of cohesion. And I think that's then plays back. But in our work, regardless which type of cohesion we come, we actually come to the slogan of this conference, cooperation is central in order to achieve cohesion in either of the ways. The point is, I would like to get cooperation out of the special niche. So for me, cooperation is a must, it's not a luxury. But that also means we would need to actually forget about Interreg and think cooperation needs to be much bigger than just a few Interreg programs. And maybe the Interreg programs are just the pioneers. Kind of you're just showing the way and we need to see how to mainstream that and think bigger. So if we mean it, I would say kind of use Interreg, use Central Europe to pioneer, to show that it's possible that it has an added value, but think going beyond that and not only about a special program. And in particularly in a world of growing interdependencies, declining finance, financial resources, we need to get that into our head. And collaboration across national borders helps to explore and exploit complementarities and synergies between places. And for me, that is essentially much more than we can do in Interact. Two weeks ago, there was the high-level group on the future of cohesion policy meeting. And there was a presentation by a professor from the Netherlands about resilience in general. So it wasn't about cooperation at all. But basically he said, if we want to boost resilience in European regions or places and competitiveness at a global scale, we need to find what are the economic complementarities between these places and other places. And if we look at the cooperation patterns in the private sector mainly now, most places or the players in most places cooperate with other players in the same country. So, the Austrian companies in Vienna cooperate, I don't know, with Austrian companies in Linz, because it's also nice. But if we really want to get good complementarities and synergies, we need to think across borders. We need to do exactly what you do in Interreg and in Central Europe, but we need to get that into another dimension. And if you remember the first slides on the capabilities, we need to think about governance, good quality governance, 
good institutions are essential to be able to act agile and flexible, flexible and reliable, and also to learn from each other and to handle change. I think I leave it here before Frank kicks me off the <laughs> podium. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Guy. I, I could have listened to you for, forever, you know. I would never kick you out of, uh, of the stage. Um, thank you very much for, for really emphasizing how important Interreg is. I have to say I'm really glad that uh, our key slogan is cooperation is central and not Interreg is central after listening to you, because we might have to think beyond Interreg, as you say. Um, I, I also listened to this uh, speech that you mentioned by Mr. Ron Bosma, I think, from the Ut uh, Utrecht uh, University. I also find this very inspiring. But um, yeah, let's hope we will not go for the agile development. As a communications person, I'm actually a big fan of agile development, uh, but maybe not in cohesion policy. So <laughs> let's not go for the third option, probably. Um, this is too risky, um, we might find. But, you're not that interested, probably, in my opinion. So I would like to in uh, introduce a few panelists now that want to discuss uh, with me, will discuss with me the inputs we heard from Minister Ehrlich, from UKI, um, from Roland uh, in the welcome address. So for this panel discussion, I would like to welcome first Mr. Slavomir Tokarski, Director for European Territorial Cooperation at the European Commission. He will be joined by Ms. Francesca Campomori, Associate Professor at the Philosophy and Cultural Heritage Department at the University of Venice, uh, talking about governance. We heard a lot about that. Luckily, uh, Francesca is a governance expert. Um, this will help us a lot in the discussion, I hope. And we will be joined by Mr. František Kubesh, head of the Department for Strategic Development and Cooperation in the statutory city of Brno. And last but not least, uh, I would like to welcome Mr. Roland Arte back on stage. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being with us today. Um, let me start with a question to you, Mr. Tokarski. We just heard a lot about the future of cohesion policy. I already mentioned that it's only 2023, and we are talking about uh, what will happen in 2027 and beyond. But if I'm not informed wrongly, in about two years, the European Commission, your institution, will have to come up with concrete proposals for the future of cohesion policy already. So. What are your plans? How will this happen? What are you doing there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me because Central Europe program is an excellent program and always when we are in need of innovative project to present somewhere at the event conference, we are looking, we are turning to Central Europe. So great, thanks for that. Now, about the future. Of, of cohesion policy. As you, you heard already about high-level group, which is working since uh, beginning of this year. Uh, I think it is, uh, uh, maybe for the first time, it has a quite a diverse composition, so there is a lot of, of not usual suspects. Uh, there are young people, there are people coming from NGOs, so uh, I also have the feeling from the debates that they had so far that the result of this reflection might be fresher and more innovative than, than usually. They will have a series of hearings and then in July we'll discuss territorial cooperation. Uh, uh, following this, they will round up a, a, a final report which will be adopted somewhere in the beginning of the next year uh, uh, and which should coincide with the adoption of the ninth cohesion report and cohesion forum which will take place somewhere in April next year. So there will be a moment for a sort of political legacy of our commissioner and contribution to the to the next financial perspective and next generation of cohesion policy. Having said that, we should remember that we will have a new parliament in place, May next year, a new commission, November next year. And when 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 the new actors are coming on this stage, they will have the the, the propensity to change probably something. 
But the, the two important moments, uh, we will have this window of opportunity between new parliament coming in and still old commission being in place. So this should be for us the moment of selling our ideas about uh, territorial cooperation for the future to the parliamentarians. We also hope to reignite the discussion on European cross-border mechanism, which will not be called cross-border European cross-border mechanism, but <laughs> Uh, where we still see a chance with the new proposal coming from the Parliament to, to bring also to the fore the cross-border dimension and, and to have it at the centre of discussions with, with the Parliament and to possibly to have it adopted somewhere in the beginning of the next year. Um, so voila, this is where we, where we stand. Uh, I think that the, if we take comparison with, the, with what was in the past, the new proposal of the Commission for, for the period post 2027 should be laid on the table somewhere in 25. So, so this will be the, the, the key moments for the debate and the key moments where we should try all to, to make a difference and, and fight for what we like. Yeah, that will be an exciting uh, moment and we will see uh, what might be the reality in the future of what Kai just presented. Um, you mentioned this high-level group and that they will discuss um, territorial cooperation in July. Uh, that title of that session is how territorial uh, cooperation could also better address challenges related to European integration. We have two practitioners here, and especially uh, Ms. Uh, you, Ms. Campomori, Francesca, um, your, you have been working on projects that have been supporting European integration and solidarity for many years now, not only in interact Central Europe. So I would be very interested, and I guess the audience would be interested, as a university professor, as a university department, why are you in Interreg? How do you work on integration with us? Thank you, and uh, good morning to all of you here in the room and uh, online. It's a real pleasure to be here again uh, in presence. Uh, be before uh, uh, directly answering to your question, I would like to make a really a brief introduction also for connecting with uh, what it has already uh, said before uh, from the key uh, note speaker. Um, cohesion policy, you, you well know, is made by different but interrelated components. In particular, uh, we can distinguish territorial, economic, social, and more recently also environmental components, and they are very well represented in the project of uh, Interreg. Uh, therefore, when we talk of cohesion, we range from public transports and connection between different regions and within the same region to the development of new and green technology, to the strategy for combating or mitigating poverty, youth unemployment, educational attainment, aging, and so on. However, as I said before, these components are strictly related. And I just want to make an example. When a policy aims at improving public transport from urban to rural areas, and it is a topic of some of the project, it is doing not just, it is affording not just the problem of mobility, but it is affording a problem, an issue of social equality, because we know that people from urban areas have lower educational attainment. And one of the reasons, not maybe uh, the main reason, but I think it's one of the important reasons, is because in this area it's difficult to reach schools and universities. And so we have to um, take care of this connection between mobility and social inequality. Why I'm telling that? I'm telling that because I think that there is an element in cohesion policy which is transversal to all the component, a kind of fil rouge, or we can uh, say a glue that uh, uh, holds the various elements together. And this element is governance, especially the governance structures, by which I mean the relation between different levels of governments, so national, European, national, local, regional, and local, but also the relation across border in public administration. For example, the relation between, just to do an example, welfare department and the registry office. It's not so obvious that in a municipality there is a cooperation, a collaboration, a communication between, an effective communication between the office 
and it ends in uh, poor uh, quality of uh, services and of course and also poor poverty in the, um, the possibility of citizens to enjoy their rights. So that's the first part of the governance. We talk the vertical dimension, but also there is another dimension which is the horizontal one and it um, has to do with the relation between public and private actors. So, I was very happy to see that in the previous call and also in this call of Central Europe, there was a topic about governance because it's, I mean, um, it's something that uh, I can understand from the, that uh, the program really um, deem important that territorial governance could lead to more uh, cohesion, uh, social cohesion policy. Just a word to our uh, project, because I am a lead partner of a project financed in this call, which is Get Cohesive, uh, the acronym of uh, Governance Announcement for Cohesive Society. In this project, our challenge is to engage people with a vulnerable background in co-designing and possibly co-decide uh, the decision about uh, their municipality, their region, the place where they live. We know that it, it's a challenge because the civic engagement is not easy for citizens um, when they are well educated because we are in a big crisis on participation, political participation especially. But we think that if we don't manage to, in some way, to engage people that have needs and they don't have voice, for example, people with refugees background, but also single mothers, uh, people mm, with um, disability, if we don't manage to, um, to listen, to hear, and possibly to make them more aware of the decision, political decision, we can't have a social cohesive a society. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca. This reminded me very much of a project application in the governance uh, priority, I have to say. It starts off like, it sounds a little bit theoretical, and you think like, it's all about governance, what is this, what does it do? And then you end up with the people, and I think this is also what Kai said, what is cohesion about? In the end, you're involving real people, people left behind, and you're actually meeting um, fully the, the objectives that we have. Not to leave a region behind means not to leave people behind, exactly. and governance is really central for that. Frantisek Kuvesh, I saw you nodding a lot. Uh, the city of Brno also has a governance project. So what are you doing and why is Interact Cooperation so important for you in what you're doing? So thank you. Thank you for being here because it's really, uh, for me, a very unique opportunity to see a lot of people that are part of uh, Central Europe community, Interact Central Europe community. And I would like to actually uh, say something uh, uh, from perspective of the city, that is, I think, relevant what Francesca said. Because, okay, we are talking about governance, and of course, at the beginning, it was really important for us to explain our politicians why this kind of project is important, why it's important exactly for city administration, why it's not actually relevant for universities to talk about the governance issue. And uh, we found that actually it's essential to talk about governance of metropolitan areas in the position of lead partner who comes from the city level, of course. And it is very important to say, and that's why I like Interact Central Europe so much, that we can combine different partners. And we have in our consortium representatives of cities, of course, regions, and universities as well. So I think that it's a really good opportunity for us to share our views and actually different perspectives. And I'm pretty sure uh, that that can lead to the result that we all wish, what we wish. And what is actually for us so important is to find the best solution, best solution about governance in areas that are actually among cities and regions. We call them metropolitan areas. You already know, for example, the concept of functional urban areas. And we would like to find mechanisms that 
will be more effective in different challenges, in different concrete uh, issues. We are talking about mobility, for example. So it's not only about to have an institution, but to know what will be the content of this institution to work on. Uh, in my perception, actually this Integrated Central Europe project is something that we can really learn a lot. City of Brno has experience with Urbact, Horizon, okay, Interact from the previous time. And uh, when I compare all these financing, in financing, financing instruments, I see that it's really important for us and very good that we can combine that. That we can start with some small issue, for example, on the level of Urbact, what was 10 years ago, first, uh, first ideas about um, function urban areas metropolitan cooperation. And now, when we are, let's say, more advanced, that we have more experience, we can continue, and even that we can be a lead partner, that we can somehow steer what will be the result of the project because at the beginning we have to actually think of that and write something in the application form. A little bit following up on this also for you, Francesca, because uh, Francesca now mentioned all the other funds that are available for you uh, at the university. There's also Horizon, probably a very interesting uh, f instrument. So we're talking about the future. So I'm wondering what would be missing if we had no Interreg in the future? Yes, I mean, mm, you, you mentioned Horizon, and for academics, Horizon is very much important, and we uh, apply uh, often in Horizon project because I, I, they have a very uh, high uh, academic profile. But at the same time, what I found in Interreg is the possibility to really make research action, which means to do, uh, to test concrete uh, solutions. And it's very difficult to do that in a, a other project. And the second point is that um, you ask to applicants to, um, to build a partnership with made by um, different profiles, so stakeholders, public actors. And we know how it's important to have uh, public actors, I mean, uh, representative of municipalities, local authorities in the partnership, even if it's not so easy. Uh, to reach this objective, and also expert academic. And so with this partnership, which is heterogeneous, but in the same way very much complementary, we really manage to do things, not just to study and to map things. And that's, I think, the added value of the project. Thank you, Francesca. Slavomir, question to you. Now you heard why Interreg is so important. Um, in this process, we have a high-level group, but will there be a chance that actually the programs or the beneficiaries of our funding have a chance to have a say into the future? Like, what, what is planned there? Like, how can we feed this feedback? Right, and, and now I'm thinking aloud because I also want to use, make use of collective intelligence here. And after all, we are talking about cooperation, so it would be strange if, if I just impose our views on you. I mean. There is one possibility that uh, uh, we are keen to have debates in member states about the future of the policy. There might be a member state which would be willing to organize such a debate about the future of territorial cooperation. That's one thing. Secondly, we'll have our annual interreg event <coughs> where we foresee the debate about the future of territorial cooperation. And I would be very keen to hear also from you how would you see the preparation for this debate. <coughs> and, and, and certainly that's something that would repeat in 2024. Then uh, uh, we will have Gorizia, uh, cultural capital of Europe, go borderless 2025. Isn't mm -hmm. it a fantastic occasion to 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 do publicity to to territorial cooperation? Can't we invite you know, celebrities and really make a big hello about that? So I think this could be also one more thing. And the, and then we of course we need we need from you the stories with this with this human dimension, the stories about people. <clears throat> I think. If you look at indicators and, and what we do, you know, it's, it's normal as, as any development project. But I think the value of, 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 of interreg projects goes well beyond that. And it's something that we do not measure usually because there is also this longer term impact of people who participate in the project and for whom it is often quite transformative experience because all of a sudden you, you, 
you get a, a, a self-assertive, you believe that you can do something with other people, you believe that it doesn't pay only to stay, stand aside, uh, and, and there is no sense in, in doing something together with the others. And I think, I, I once I spoke a lady from one of Interact projects who told me that for her participating was a social innovation thing, was a really transformative experience. It totally changed her perception about herself and the world around. And I think this is a type of experience which we need now more, more than ever if you take it as a background against uh, all this divisive politics, tribalism, or apathy, which is also very important for the society. So I think I would be tempted to, to run a sort of little audit on project beneficiaries and see to what extent we see not only growth and jobs and indicators, but also we see a sort of longer term change of perception and change of attitude. So is this a question for the audience yes. now? <laughs> so, so maybe to repeat the questions so that, uh, and then you just, uh, or you wanna, let's see whether we get some feedback then in the questions because I think it needs more than just raising hands to answer this. Roland, I would like to maybe, I don't think the member states will have any difficulties to have an influence on the debate. So, and the discussion already started, I understand, in the Council about the future of cohesion policy. Um, I read the, um, the Council conclusions on the eighth cohesion report, and, and something that I read there was, let me quote, cohesion policy needs to become simpler and more effective and has to avoid the tendency to multiply the funds. Do we have to be worried from a national perspective? Like, how do you see this? Um, thank you for the question, but you're asking me more or less as a representative of a member state, and so the formal answer is that the discussion has not yet started. <laughs> um, so, um, also, um, yeah, to also make you aware that um, no, uh, cooperation actors on all levels, also on our levels, um, uh, closing old programs, are starting new programs, and of course are joining in the future debate. And, by um, starting to reflect, and insofar we are welcoming any uh, uh, opportunity to reflect, also to listen and to get ideas, because of course uh, the phase now is an important phase to, um, for analyzing, for building fact-based narratives, uh, scenarios, and so on, in order to, to develop the, the, the opinion. Um, also, a formal or official answer is that, of course, as Austria, we are quite attentive uh, on this, um, for this discussion, also on the council level. And you refer to council conclusions, which are not really designing the new future of cohesion policy, but are somehow circling around principles. And um, uh, as Austria, we have raised voice to, um, to enter paragraphs on cooperation, both on the conclusions um, on the eighth cohesion report and also during the French presiden presidency in order that it's on the map. I think this, uh, on, on, so we are quite uh, supportive, uh, not to forget uh, the cooperation dimension and also Interreg as, a, as a, not a, a small member, but, but as a member of the cohesion policy family, because when we are talking about co also cohesion policy in the future, it will probably comprise different parts, cooperation, will be a part and Interreg is now a member and should remain a member um, and uh, I think for that we are uh, of course a partner being Austria. Uh, for, uh, yeah. in, as you know our ge geography is somehow leading that I think 90% of the, the country is um, um, yeah, part of Interreg. <laughs> Cross border even and transnational we are you know, as a whole country. Uh, on the eligible map of, uh, of three programs. Okay, this is somehow um, the you. official answer. Um, maybe what we think is important is also for the ongoing work and the reflection to discuss the territorial dimension of Interreg, because of course there's a territorial functionality, and the role of the European level, because I think Interreg is also an example that the, the EU level, despite of discussion about competences and so on, has a functional role it's simply 
most of the activities, many of the activities would simply not happen without an youth uh, incentive uh, by funding, but also macro-regional frameworks, other frameworks. So the EU is an, an important functional partner for, for cross-border cooperation. This is simply a fact. And I think that on that we should also build, um, not only to look at the funds, but at the functional system in order to to, to, to enhance cooperation, also in the direction Kai was, was referring to, that even the business sector is needing more, more cooperation. Uh, we also find interesting discussion on the innovation agenda in Europe, on, on the, 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 the scoreboard, and, and those kind of discussion where also in respect to transformation, cooperation is regarded a, an asset or a way to, to become more resilient, as Kai said. So these, these dimensions, I think, have to be reflected and we are quite confident that the European Commission and the, the not only the high level group but the, the bulk of discussion yeah. will take up the, the different strengths. So bigger, better beyond Interreg rather than forget Interreg hopefully. <laughs> but the discussion has not started yet so we don't know. Frantisek, I understand uh, you want to react on this as well. Thank you. I wanted to react. Actually all these interventions are uh, very relevant to let's say international and national level, but I would like to stress the importance of local level as well and regional one. So, for example, just today, a group of Czech cities that are implementing integrated territorial investment tool are, get, are together and are discussing uh, possible scenarios or possible positions towards a new programming period in order to be prepared for a discussion for, uh, with national Level and in the Czech Republic, we have already introduced the let's say platform for this kind of discussion. We call it National Permanent or Standing Conference, uh, and there are actually different participants, all the relevant ministries, regions, big cities implementing ITIs uh, and local action groups. So it means let's say smaller municipalities. And of course now we are discussing current uh, programming period and closing the previous one. Uh, but I assume that we will have this kind of discussion maybe next year that should actually start again the discussion. What should be the national priorities? What should be the role of territorial uh, partners? And I think that can be tip for you uh, maybe to launch or to discuss with the national level to introduce such a let's say platform um, it's in-person platform that can be uh, for you the platform for sharing your thoughts and ideas and for actually uh, exchanging maybe the views uh, in order to have really good uh, national position to be prepared and for task force and discussions that we know that will come very very soon, 2024 or 2025. It's tomorrow. It's nothing. Yeah, thank you very much, Frantisek, for making this point. And indeed, the regional level is crucial. I mean, in the end, we are discussing a European policy-making process, but it has to be bottom-up like Interreg is. So before I come to a last question here from my end, I would like to remind you, think about your questions already here in the audience, raise your hand in a few minutes. Um, ask your questions to one of the panelists. Kai will also join us on stage. So if you have any uh, questions to his scenarios um, or online, you have Slido just to the right of your screen. You can just type in a question. Dana will soon join me here on stage and we will see what questions we have there. But before we get to the questions, a last question to you, uh, Slavomir. Um, now you're in DG Regio, but you have experience in other DGs. And we heard about this agile, like, other funds becoming more important, maybe less important for a cohesion policy in, on the European level. Uh, from your experience from, the, from other DGs, uh, do you think there is a strong support also for cohesion policy or do you see rather like, yeah, we really need to make that case, how cohesion policy is there for the people and how it is different from thematic funds and instruments maybe? Right. Uh, um, I mean, indeed, it will be coming under pressure, right? And there are all those two schools. One is saying that, yeah, there will be a lot of discussion, but in the end, we will be more or less as we were. And the other one, which is saying, oh, this time is going to be different because we have RRF and some member states seem to like it because it comes without so many complications. 
uh, uh, we have a bit of mission drift in the cohesion policy, right? We have too many missions, we have too many funds. We are addressing crisis quite successfully, but this leads a little bit to this blurring of the central mission of the cohesion policy. So I think that this time the changes will be quite significant. <clears throat> But coming back to this idea that cooperation is central for cohesion and cooperation is central for the European project. I mean, I have the experience from two fields where this notion is percolating quite uh, strongly. One is defense, where we are talking right now about European defense policy, and we understand that cooperation makes a lot of sense. And the other is industrial policy. When we are looking at reshoring, we are looking at supply chains, we are saying, oh, we have to create those European ecosystems because we have different excellences, different capacities in different parts of Europe. So when we are connecting them, we can be globally competitive, right? And I think this, this notion should percolate also to, to, the, to the cohesion policy. And, and we are always in this unfortunate situation that everybody is saying that cooperation is great, uh, but then when it comes to the budgetary negotiations, <laughs> everybody is looking into his own pocket and, and, and that's it. So we have to break this deadlock and, and I really believe that cooperation should become a central theme for cohesion policy for both real solid economic reasons but also for those human reasons. I mean because looking beyond your territory, looking across the, the border, uh, showing empathy, interest is really a cornerstone of, of European project, mm -hmm. right? So we have this very clear mission and we have this very clear narrative and we really have to, 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 to just bring it to the to the four. I'm not saying that 50% of cohesion policy should go to Interreg. <laughs> <laughs> currently, it's 3% 3, 3 currently. That would be quite an increase. I guess many would be happy with the, uh, if it becomes double, but even that is probably asking for too much. I see some nodding here from the member state level already, so <laughs> I guess we will not manage that. But anyway, we shall, we shall be ambitious. And there's, there's one more point we should not forget, like enlargement. Huh? And, and with macro-regional strategies, with the programs are, which are operating on our external border, we have a big case uh, to make. Uh, and uh, I saw already what's happening on the border with Ukraine right now, with, with Moldova. And not only about enlargement, about, about I mean, giving something to, to both Western Balkans and Ukraine and giving something concrete and quickly, uh, because there is the dynamic of the enlargement process which, which should be somehow followed, and, 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 and we cannot just leave those countries somewhere in, in, in the limbo. So there probably there is a big potential for what we can do. Uh, uh, I just discussed recently with colleagues from near the reconstruction process for Ukraine. I mean, we, Interreg, we are the only ones to have institutions that know procedures, that know about audits, that uh, created partnership with European countries who, where people know each other. It's a big asset also for reconstruction. So I think that's also the card we should play. Thank you. I think Something that I really like about Interreg is that we have a lot to show without comparatively high financing behind it. If you look into other programs and other instruments, and I think we will hear a lot about this in the afternoon, we are really efficiently spending our money that we have the little 3% that are left for Interreg. Not only transnational cooperation, that's even a lot less, but um, I think especially in the afternoon when we hear more about our 53 projects from you all, we will see what we can actually achieve all together in cooperation. Dana, do you want to join me? Do we have any questions for the panel, maybe? Maybe a quick round of applause first for the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dana. You've been following Slido. I don't know yes, if there's indeed. anything there. Um, our audience in Slido is very much interested in a second call already, so <laughs> <laughs> I believe they are patient, unpatiently waiting for the next presentation. So there are a few questions about the second call and project development already. But there is one um, that is um, dealing more with uh, what we can do to be more visible as Interreg for policymakers. I believe we have policymakers here right now, so we are doing it, actually a measure to make Interreg more visible, but maybe you have uh, additional thoughts and tips uh, for the person asking the questions. Mm. Well, I take the opportunity to say something as the first. Um, for me, it's actually a challenge, and I think what we can do is actually not to speak only as uh, experts within our silo or within our group, and it's quite complicated issue that we are dealing now, but to invite politicians uh, 
to our events that we are going to have. We will have kickoff meetings, so we uh, were discussing with our leading politicians to be part of that, to, to, to see what will be actually the, the program and maybe to implement them somehow into program that they could have opportunity to, to say something, to express their views and to discuss, to learn other partners from our consortium. Uh, actually, that it's not only a project that will end with some research and studies and so on, but that will be really something that we can in the end say, okay, it brought these results and these results will be implemented. And for example, our program should lead to uh, have know-how for implementing metropolitan cooperation and metropolitan governance in an effective way, not only in the Czech Republic, but on, uh, in all member states that are not so advanced. It can be Slovak Republic as well, Hungary and so on. Thank you, Fantishek. Are there any questions here in the room, maybe? No, no raised hands. We know it's early to discuss the future. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope it was really inspiring. Uh, is there in any more on Slido? Indeed, maybe? there is one that is now on the top, um, directed at you, Mr. Tokarski. And um, the person would like to know what are your thoughts about inclusion and inclusivity in the EU policies uh, for the vulnerable group groups. So what is really the, uh, the idea behind the mainstreaming of inclusion in EU policies? Well, I mean, the inclusiveness, uh, you know, gender, uh, uh, I mean, it's all very, very, very cornerstone of, of cohesion policy, not only not only for Interreg, but I think uh, even in your project, uh, in your program, you had this very nice project with social innovation and migrants. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic example. And it's, this is one of those examples of real, I mean, those stories with people who, who are uh, in a vulnerable position, and then they are part of a project. They are the, those fantastic human stories, right? They, they really lend themselves very nice to storytelling, and the storytelling rings very well with young people, for example, which often look for those values of really of fairness and solidarity. Even with my mother-in-law, I have to say, which is very <laughs> anti-European. <but. laughs> so uh, um, now I think that we have already many stories, right? Uh, uh, and it's not only about uh, social inclusion and vulnerability, it's also about young people. And, and that's maybe something that we should also mention, both in terms of communicating and involving. And I was mentioning this transformative experience. There was one project in, in I think, in Thessaloniki, where students were working with, with kids in order to, to make them convince their families about the use of, uh, uh, well, zero waste and so on. And uh, it was a great project for both for kids mm -hmm. who all of a sudden found that their father, their parents can listen to them and change their behavior, but also for the students who work with the kids. And, and I think these are those experiences that we really should uh, highlight and, and make a good use of in the, in the communication. Thank you. Indeed, also what I find very interesting in our projects is you read what they do very often, then you meet the project and you see what really is happening. And then you actually understand that it's very much about the people to come back to Kai and not about some theoretical improvements. It's yeah. about real improvements already also on the level of Interreg. I mean, here in Vienna you have the hotel. I mean, that was when I was involved in social innovation and which got award. And this is a hotel for migrants run by migrants and it and found its way to BBC, you know, all over Europe, right? I can see Francesca smile because that was her project last uh, programming period and um, I guess you will have a lot to talk to uh, about in the coffee break or so talking about the coffee break there's one question yes please uh, I will just bring you the microphone quickly <laughs> thank you thank you yes my name is Gerd Troch from Hungary um, we are neighbor of uh, Ukraine and Mr. Tokarski you mentioned the enlargement dimension of let's say the future cohesion policy and uh, also Mr. Apta also um, uh, highlighted the let's say territorial aspect of uh, future cohesion policy how do you see let's say potential developments in with regard to cohesion policy and in particular also with the potential role of interact programs in relation for example with the strong integration of ukraine or in other countries concerned maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that it would be interesting thank you maybe. 
Well, I, I don't have a crystal ball on, on what will happen in Ukraine, right? But, but uh, first of all, uh, uh, from the contact with Ukrainians, we see that <clears throat> now for them, um, participation in, in cross-border programs or in Black Sea or in Danube is really sort of a glimpse of, of, of into better future or better reality. So notwithstanding uh, uh, the situation, they are really working hard and, and, and they are doing the project. And uh, so, so that's something which, which is very, I mean, emotionally also very, very moving. Uh, again, as I, as I, as I, I mean, this is a little bit guessing work, but let's see what will happen to Ukraine. And assuming that it stays, stays in a form of, of a state that is that is still capable of acting, uh, 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 with all the uh, uh, ideas that they made up about uh, entering the union, I think one way or another, because you know that probably will not happen overnight. Probably will take much longer than they think. But then we will have to offer something in between something more than the standard accession process. And there probably there is a big potential in what we could do with our program, what we could do with the cohesion policy. And it's not only Ukraine, it's also Moldova, which is now in a very delicate situation. And we also see that our programs can make a big difference. There are also instruments of, of, of uh, uh, macro-regional strategies which have a good potential for that. And we are working with Interreg Europe in order to open it up for, for Western Balkans and for Ukraine and Moldova, because that's also another vehicle that could be very useful in the context of, of, of the future. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the audience, maybe? Dana, is there anything on Slido? We have time for a last round, don't be shy. Just because I mentioned the coffee break doesn't mean we have to break now. <laughs> so if there's any more questions, please. Uh, yeah, there is one. Uh, microphone will come, Bernard. Uh, Bernhard Schausberger from Interact. And it's a question to you, Mr. Tokarski. I've seen now that, for example, the, the leader approach has been first mainstreamed into rural development policy, and now it has arrived under PO5 in cohesion policy, and I see a few attempts to mainstream cooperation into cohesion policy. But I would say these, all these attempts so far have been very limited and haven't been, been picked up by the member states. My question, is there any scenario also to push a bit on this end? Because it's quite obvious that Interreg is a nice specialist niche, but of course, if cooperation is properly mainstreamed into cohesion policy, there would be probably, with a couple of strokes, 6%, 9%, 12% of cohesion policy funding available for cooperation initiatives. That would be my right. question. So I think I think we, we did our our best, and I think we did our job during the negotiations because basically every program has right now a formulation concerning so-called well, it's not the most charming word embedding. That is that regions should engage in and use the mainstream resources also for for the for the cooperation. We see some promising examples, few but promising. We will push for it, but it's also the the the, uh, the job of, of people in the regions to, to, to use this opportunity. So uh, I'm modestly optimist, I, 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 I say. Because indeed, I mean, it's, it's, it's somehow paradox that again, everybody is for cooperation and there was, there has been since many years this opportunity for the region to spend money outside the region. It was benefiting the region itself. I think nobody did it so far. So we have to push. Uh, uh, I think the prerequisites are there. I see already at least four or five regions which engage quite seriously. So uh, I think there's still a long way to, to, to go, but, but I have some hopes. Thank you. Um, if there's no more questions on Slido and in the room, I think now is a good time to break for coffee. Um, what I take from this, especially uh, the, the last uh, remarks uh, you made, maybe a symbiotic relationship with cohesion policy. The bigger one is healthy for Interreg to make cooperation even more central than it is already today. So I think we will have interesting discussions in the next two years. Thank you very much again to all the panelists for being here. Maybe another round of applause. Thank you very much.
And with this, we will break for coffee. But Dana, I think you have a... Do you have a few remarks? What, how will we continue? When will we continue? Now we are five minutes late. <laughs> 11.30, I hope it is fine with you to meet back again here. And we will have this uh, exciting opening of a second call. So I believe it's enough time to still have a few discussions with your peers. Maybe you meet people you don't know yet. But please be back at 11.30 where we continue with a session on the second call. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome back. Hello. Can you please take your seats now? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being in time. Perfect. So I think we can start the next session and I believe our online audience is really interested in this one. And I believe also some of you in this room might be applying in our second call. So welcome back again. Now the exciting moment is coming. We are going to launch the second call. Indeed, and I believe that um, we can sort of involve more also the online audience. What do you think? We haven't heard that much of them. You, can, you are also happy to grab your phone and use Slido with the hashtag Cooperation is Central. And before we go into the details on the second call, we thought to ask our audience whether they plan to apply. So there is a simple question in Slido posted right now. Do you plan to apply? We have 51 answers already and most of them are going to apply. Excellent. Let's wait another, I will wait for another 25 people maybe to join our Slido poll. Fifty-six percent say yes. Seven now. There are only few of you that will not apply, so I believe this session is exactly for you. I see that some people have not yet decided whether to apply or not, so I believe they are patiently waiting for this presentation. And for this, I would like to invite on stage uh, our honored speakers and my colleagues. Um, briefly, let me introduce the three speakers. We will have Nadia Kobe. Nadia Kobe is working for the Ministry for Regional Development and Cohesion in Slovenia, and she is currently the chair of the monitoring committee. We will then have Kristiane Breznik. Kristiane Breznik is a managing authority of the Interreg Central Europe program, and she is working also for City of Vienna. Last but not least, the only man on the stage for the session, Luca Ferrarese, head of the Interreg Central Europe Secretariat. Please, may I ask you to join me on a stage? Thank you very much. So for my first question, I will turn to you, Nadia. I hope your mic is working. And um, before we actually launch the call, we should maybe have a look and give some more details on what happened in the call that we have closed. So can you maybe tell us a bit um, how did it go with the first call? Good morning, uh, dear institutions, our colleagues. Uh, hello, Adana. Uh, let us proceed. So with the first call, I will mention briefly the statistics uh, because we think it's relevant for you to know where we stand now as a program and you as institutions. 
let me start with uh, the success uh, we and you together have made with the first call and starting already at the application stage. There was a huge interest uh, 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 to apply uh, and uh, we received 280 applications uh, with uh, 2,600 institutions involved. Uh, it's of special importance to note that 60% of these institutions uh, are newcomers to Central Europe uh, program. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, this is very interesting um, figure that 60% are completely new to our program and maybe even sitting here in this room. But uh, let's dive maybe a deep deeper and see what are the results of the call that we have closed. Yes. <clears throat> so, 53 projects were approved. Uh, 53 projects then initially envisaged. Uh, only 72 million were earmarked at the beginning. Uh, as you can see at the bottom right uh, corner of the screen, 50, uh, 560 partners uh, are cooperating and they come from all nine member states. Uh, that is displayed uh, uh, at uh, top and uh, ranging from 36 to 88 from each participating country. At the bottom, again, you will see three times approximately uh, 200, uh, uh, 200 strategies will be prepared, 200 pilot actions and 200 solutions from the pilot actions are expected from these uh, projects. Again, among those uh, 560 uh, institutions, 50% are newcomers to this program. Thank you very much, um, Nadia. Now, maybe people are also interested in how is the division on the thematics. So, can we maybe have a look into how the thematic division is now distributed along the call, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, so we have four thematic priorities and if you look uh, uh, at the bottom line, there is a link. Uh, if you follow this link uh, through the website, then you will find uh, thematic tutorials that will explain uh, briefly what the specific objectives are about. In priority one, there are two specific objectives, namely innovation capacities and smart skills. And uh, as you can see, uh, in the first one, as many as 11 projects were uh, approved, whereas in the second one, only three. So, the first one is a clear winner among the specific objectives uh, uh, under the first call, whereas in the second one, uh, we would like to encourage you to uh, put some efforts for the second call. Perfect. So now it's all clear for the priority for Smart Central Europe. Let's uh, have a look at the priority that is actually the most robust one and more, most complex one. I see already five boxes. So what does it tell me? What does it tell our applicants? So these boxes should tell you that there are five specific objectives under priority two, neutral, uh, climate neutral energy transition, uh, then uh, climate change uh, resilience, uh, circular economy, uh, the environment and green urban mobility. Uh, in the left three, you can see that five to six projects uh, have been approved, uh, whereas uh, uh, to the right situation is similar to priority one. Uh, circular economy, although a very new specific 
self-standing specific objective uh, uh, for the Interreg uh, has uh, nine projects running already, whereas Green Urban Mobility only three. And again, please, uh, uh, please, uh, you are encouraged to uh, do some more under this specific objective. Thank you very much indeed. The difference between nine and three is uh, exactly six, <laughs> which is on the other boxes. So this is clear message to our applicants, I believe. And what about the priorities uh, dealing with transport and governance to conclude the thematic overview? Transport um, is uh, an old friend of ours in the programme. Uh, now we have received only four projects, uh, but not to despair. And uh, this very new uh, governance for integrated territorial development has produced several very interesting projects and six of them were approved. Now, uh, as we are concluding, Now it's also enhanced with the filter, so if you want to check what is what we fund under uh, Interact Central Europe program right now, you are very easy to navigate because you have a filter which can help you to sort exactly the thematics that you are interested in. But this is it, I believe, for uh, the first call. Uh, I believe, um, Christiane, the turn would be with you. And uh, could you please tell us something, what is happening? Are we opening the call today? And what are the next steps? Uh, no, that is a joke. Of course. Yes, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, of course, we are opening today. Actually, we are opening in a short moment. Um, uh, I also would like to thank the, the team and uh, uh, of the GS to have all done the preparatory works and not to forget the member states that with their decisions and the valuable discussions made it possible that uh, we can launch the second call. Um, I can uh, present you also the timeline. And uh, in these annual conferences, I always very happy in opening calls because this is really a nice thing <laughs> to do. You know, you just say, go for it and uh, get, uh, get the money to the ground. So uh, in the timeline, you see four circles. Two are clear, which is the date uh, when we launch it, which is today. And the clear date is also for the closure. and this will then give you uh, the possibility to start in spring 24. So we will be uh, more knowledgeable on the 18th of May when we have received your applications and then uh, we will of course discuss with member states and inform them to give them a clearer time plan on the decision. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, we heard a lot about the thematics of the first call, so maybe now it's the uh, right time to give us the call basics on the, uh, am I the right applicant, is my expertise really wanted in this call? Yes, exactly. So, um, for uh, what the Member States, the Monitoring Committee has decided is uh, to leave the second call open, so for all four priorities, and all nine specific objectives. But I hope that you have also followed the explanation of Nadia in the previous intervention closely that some of them, uh, we have already received uh, a lot of excellent uh, applications. So it is not that the, uh, uh, that the, the specific objectives are, are closed or restricted, but we would definitely encourage you to look at those specific objectives where we have not received or not approved so many applications so far. Uh, but in general, it's open. Uh, and here I also uh, encourage you to 
follow the webinars and everything uh, that helps you to better understand what we would like to see in the thematic scope. I think Luca will then, in uh, his intervention, also give you more insights in the support measures. Um, transnationality, so we uh, expect project partnerships with a minimum of three partners from three countries. Two of them have mandatorily to come from the program area. But this is, I think, a rule that you know already and you are very familiar with that. And the procedure is a one-step procedure. So we do expect that you hand in, at the latest by the 17th of May, a fully filled in application form. So we are not for two steps, it's a one-step procedure with a fully filled in application form to be eligible. Indeed, this is very important. Yeah, but what about the money, right? I mean, there is always the question whether yeah. there is enough money for my, for my priority. Uh, when is there enough money? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is, this is uh, very easy to, to, to answer, never. But uh, uh, I think you also got from Nadia's speech before that uh, we were positively surprised by the first call. So we have allocated uh, more funds than the member states intended to do so, but the applications were very, very good quality and we didn't want to postpone starting off of very good applications. Uh, still, uh, we think that for the second call, indicatively, we will also uh, put uh, overall 60 million euros of ERDF in the second call. So it is an indicative amount. Uh, of course, it will not be to the cent. And uh, you can also here uh, see the distribution on the thematic priorities. It is following the uh, uh, IP, so how we actually also in the program have foreseen the percentage per priority. So there will be 18 million for uh, the Smarter Europe, then really matters. Quality counts, competition will be high. Uh, you also have maybe noticed, I do not know where to look. I think the cameras are there. So we are followed by nine, 900 uh, people on stream. So uh, yeah, interest is there. And we are very happy about that. And we encourage you to, to do a good job. Can we maybe break it down and stay on a level on a project? So uh, if uh, the project is going to apply, what are uh, the features that they have to respect? Yes. Again, these are recommended features. So you do not need to say, OK, this is, this is the obligation to, uh, to keep it. But we also thought of a little bit uh, reducing the, the, the dimension of the project. So partnerships from 5 to 12 partners is a recommended size. Then uh, the budget uh, should be ideally between 1.2 million and 1.9 million euro of ERDF, so of the funding. Uh, and uh, the duration a little bit less than in the first call, so uh, to, 36, uh, to 30 months uh, instead of 36. But as I said, these are recommendations. You can make uh, bigger projects with a bigger partnership with more money, also longer or shorter or smaller ones. But it should be kind of um, justified. So if it fits to your project proposal, then it's fine. So, but these are our recommendations. And if you uh, choose to have another project feature, then it's good if you can uh, uh, good explain it, why this is like that. Thank you very much for this, Christiane. We know also that the Interreg money is uh, not for everyone. Uh, so is there any way that people can check whether they are the right people to yes. and institutions mostly yeah. to apply? I mean, we have actually uh, now implemented uh, a very easy tool for those that have not participated yet in our program to see if they are eligible 
from a principle. So there is this uh, uh, tool that's called Can You Get Funded? So to make a test just to see if you with your partnership, if you fit in the general eligibility principles. We have then uh, further tools. So when you, when you say, okay, I, it's the green light at the end. Yes, uh, I do meet all the eligibility and formal requirements. Then we have other tools uh, that help you to assess your project application and Luca will go into detail on that. But I think this is a new one. So for everyone that is new on the territory and wants to see, do I fit in this program? Uh, is my idea the one? Is my partnership okay? Then just click you through through this tool. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm turning now to you, Luca. Uh, I believe a test like that can be very helpful, but to apply like that, it's really not just about the tool. So there is probably much more to do, more to read, right? Yeah, uh, of course, there is a lot to work on. And uh, I think for us, it's really important to make clear to the applicants where they can get the right information. And the right information is basically uh, divided into three parts, three different strategic documents. One is the Interact program. What is this document? Is this, the doc this is the document which was adopted by the European Commission. It was drafted by the member states. And I mean, I'm coming from projects. I know very often that applicants look at the call, at the application form, and basta, basically. And <laughs> sometimes this document is neg neglected. But here you find a lot of information uh, about the challenges, about the needs of the regions. And this information is not coming from, from the sky. This is coming from a long process of negotiation and discussion with also stakeholders in the territories. So you find information on the needs there, and then you find a lot of information on what the program is funding. Member states put a lot of effort and a lot of strategic thinking in defining activities, actions, topics that are addressed under each priority. So please look into that, because this is crucial information in order to make your proposal successful. Then we have the program manual. The program manual is the book of rules. We try to keep it as slim as possible. I'm proud to say that this is now, we turn from the old times 200 pages to 90 pages, 95 pages. And above all, this is online. It's a wiki which is available on our website. It's very easy to consult and there you find general information on the program, on the rules. You find information on how to apply. And then you have inf information on how to implement, because when you design your project, you need already to think about how to implement it, what are the rules for implementation. And then, of course, there is the application package, which is the call specific set of documents in which you have the term of reference, which tells you on top of what is in the program manual, what applies to the call, what are the specific requirements. The information that Christiana gave you on the budget, on the type of projects, on the characteristic of projects, you find out there. And there, then, you have also the possibility to, uh, to have another document, which is very important, which is the application form guideline. It's a document, it's a PDF, in which you can read for each text box of the application form what we expect you to write. And this is something which is also very important to understand. Then, of course, we have the templates for declarations that you have to submit to us, and we have some tools. I mean, there is one which is very interesting, which is a project summary generator, which helps you to write a summary, like a little bit automatizing, but in future we will improve this, I was told by my colleagues. <laughs> Not yet, <laughs> but we will come to that. Uh, there will be a future maybe in which the artificial intelligence will write proposals, but <laughs> we will see. <laughs> and then uh, there is an offline version of the application form, which is totally open. You can use it as a word file in order to exchange information, but keep in mind that you can submit only through our monitoring system, which is called GEMS. So application only through GEMS. This is definitely yes. an important...
on our website, which is available there. And there we turn the assessment criteria and assessment questions into a, a format of a checklist. Do I fulfill this requirement? Am I relevant for the program? Yes or no? And this will somehow help you in doing a self-assessment, but please be honest with that. Try to see from, from an outside perspective when you are looking at your project against this selection criteria, because this could make the difference between, let's say, a successful or non-successful proposal, really. Speaking of successful proposals, now what is uh, really happening with the selection? So who is the right body to de who decides, actually, people might ask. Okay, uh, the selection process is a rather complex process in which we as technical body perform decide on the selection or rejection of proposals. Uh, it happens in two steps. There is a first step which is called relevance filter in which we look only at some aspects of your proposal. And you will see in the term of reference, and this is a novelty compared to the first call, in the term of reference you will see exactly the chapters of the application form that we will be assessing when performing the relevance filter. might be already, uh, uh, let's say, taken out from the process now, because uh, we do this step in order to be a little bit quicker in the assessment and in the selection process, but also to give already a message to those which do not make it. Unfortunately, you didn't make it, but please consider other funding instruments or to reapply or to, to reshape your proposal to take other opportunities. So we want to give quick answers to our regions. We don't want to wait years before somebody knows whether it is passing or not. Then there is the full assessment, which is carried out on those proposals which are passing the relevance filter, and here we do the assessment on the entire application form, following all the detailed criteria that you have in the term of reference. And this is where then we present the information to the monitoring committee, also in the first step, but also especially in the second step, in which the monitoring committee then decides for funding. And this is happening in you said beginning of 24. Uh, I do expect many proposals coming. I could see there is a lot of interest. So I might, I might say that you are right and we will not manage to do it earlier. But we will do our best. <laughs> Thank you very much for that as well. So uh, there is definitely a lot to read, a lot to digest. We did all the tests. So is there anything that the program does for someone? We saw that there are people marked as maybe I want to apply, can we motivate them, can we support them somehow? Sure. Um, we do our best to support our territories. And when I say we, I don't mean only the managing authority and joint secretariat, but also and especially our network of contact points in the nine countries of Central Europe. Uh, we have published tutorials. They are on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe on that because you find information on the thematic topics. They were mentioned also by Nadia before. And also you find information on technical aspects, technicalities on how to write your proposal, talking about budget, talking about state aid, talking about many things. Uh, then we offer personal support. What does it mean? We mean that we offer non-compulsory, uh, let's say voluntary, individual consultations with us. You submit us your project idea, and we have a talk, which is tractor.
And this is also something which we thought it is important to have it specialized from those people which are really dealing on a daily basis. They are sitting over there uh, <laughs> with, this, with this system, which is, I have to say, working really, really well. Coming, of course, from Interact, because this is a joint system with many programs. Perfect, thank you. We heard many times national contact points, question and answers. So maybe there is already a plan because when we are opening now and closing in May, so I believe we already have a schedule, right, Luca? Well, we have to rush. I mean, I wanted to inform you and to highlight uh, this date, 30th of March. Please pin this in your calendar because in this day you will have the possibility to get in touch with us live on a web stream. Uh, in a webinar in which you can pose questions and we will be there answering your questions until we exhaust all your questions. We will be there for a long time and we will try to do our best to answer to all your questions. Um, and that's why we have this event on the 30th of March and the day after. is happening in our countries in, these, uh, uh, in this time between the launch of the call and let's say uh, until mid-April and we will have a number of these info days which you see in these slides and they are also published online. Uh, so you will be really much welcome to go to these info days to listen in your language what is going on, what is the, uh, uh, the specific requirements and in these info days the JS will always be represented by somebody from our team. Indeed, I, I can just add that there are also some, maybe countries missing, but there was already happening something in Germany and Czech Republic before we are meeting here in, on the 22nd of March, right. to cooperate or if you have an idea you can publish your idea there I have an idea but I'm looking for this and that kind of partner is there anyone there who is interested in that and this is a very much working B2 match platform and I have to tell you up today I think we have more than 1200 registered participants institutions plus dozens of ideas project ideas which are there which are for me and they are <laughs> doing their meetings in these platforms even. They're exchanging information. So I have to say it's, it's a very good tool and I hope this will be, I think this will be also the future for this kind of matchmaking in the internet world. Indeed, and also a message from us to the applicants who are connecting online, please make use of this applicant community. As I was following the questions uh, from the first session, I believe there are many questions directly to the second call. But before we do it, thank you very much for the presentation. Maybe a bit of applause for our speakers. And I'm in Frank, you are the man. You have now all the power of an iPad and the questions coming in. Well, so with the exception of Luca, I think we see that uh, finance is female. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm just here to ask questions. I hope you're a little bit afraid already. Um, <laughs> and as you probably all know, the best questions start with perhaps just a comment. <laughs> I have one here. Um, many, many people like that question, so I have to ask it. So, Let's see who will answer it. So, perhaps just a comment. Eight weeks to apply, then one year to receive the funding. 
It seems a little unbalanced, little I say, is not in the question, and not quite in line with the urgency of climate change. So why does it take a few months to select the projects? I mean, I have to say thank you for this question. Money here. Uh, if you go to a bank to get a loan, I'm pretty sure they will take a while to give it and you have to produce many papers. We are giving money here and we have to ensure that fairness is there, that uh, strategic vision is there. We are not funding just traveling people, we are funding concrete ideas leading to results. <coughs> we do in the most possible professional way, involving <coughs> external experts, involving different opinions also inside the team and with the full participation of the member states in this process. So this takes time. We already improved. I remember in the old times or in the old style programs in which you had eligibility requirements which were lasting only three months for that. Now the eligibility checks last 10 days. So we are improving. We are, there is always room for improvement, but we are committed to do our best. That's why we said a year but maybe connect to our website on the, I don't know if 18, but maybe 19 of May or 20 of May, and you will find more information precisely, because you have also to consider that we receive so many applications. We have so many proposals submitted, and this is very good, but this is also a lot of work. And we have to give to each application the same chance to win uh, uh, the funding. Thank you, Luke. Thank you very much. Maybe before I give the floor again to Frank and Slido, is there any urgent question now from the audience? We have also the flying mic, if you like to ask a question. Any applicants? No? You're all busy with the new projects you're working yeah. on. Very good to see. <laughs> so maybe Frank? So, um, yeah, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, or not me, but uh, Slido has a lot of questions. And... Um, Let's take this one there. It's been upvoted also very, very much. And it's about differences between the first call and the second call. So here the question is, uh, can you please focus a little bit more on what is different compared to the two calls? Because they were both open and all funding priori priorities and all specific objectives. What is different? Yeah, I think that uh, we have tried already to, to, to elaborate a little bit that uh, uh, and also Nadia has given you uh, the analysis that we have uh, received some uh, very good proposals uh, with the different quantity in the different specific objectives and they have already addressed some topics. So I think that uh, going through the website and I think more information on the funded projects will be there on the website soon, uh, where you will also see uh, what the projects do that are already funded and what we encourage you, and this is maybe different to the first call, to see also which areas have not been touched that much and if your project is fitting there. As I said, it, it's still open, but it might be then the competition uh, to those specific objectives where we have received already a lot of topics that already address very well the challenges in the IP might be a little bit harder. So this would be the, the main um, end. Of course, project size should be a bit smaller and duration a little bit shorter. Thank you very much, Christiane. Maybe I can complement saying that there is also less money compared to the first <laughs> call, which is also something to reflect on, because as we said, there will be competition. Uh, this doesn't mean that I'm disencouraging people to apply. You have, you have to, to apply, but still, uh, uh, it's just a difference. It's visible and uh, we, want, we would love to have more money, but unfortunately this is the money we have and we will do our best to spend it in the best way. Actually, Nadia, I think this is a question that takes me to you because in the first call, 
we, dis we, we said like, okay, we are going to finance projects worth 70 millions. In the end, it was nearly 199 millions. So what happens if we are again receiving many, many excellent applications? Can these all be financed like we did in the first call or? Uh, no, I'm sorry to say <laughs> that this time it's a little bit tougher. Uh, we must also see it uh, in the perspective of the program cycle. Uh, like in the previous period, we have to think a lot about uh, the different types uh, of projects uh, 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 and different types of calls. Uh, so this time the projects will be standard type of projects, uh, slightly shorter probably, or maybe a little bit more focused. And then uh, a gap analysis, uh, a proper gap analysis follows. And then the third call might, there is a tendency that the third call might be even um, smaller and uh, filling out the gaps compared with what we expected. Uh, it's obvious that our Intrek program is relevant and still relevant for the second call as it was only approved in 2021. But then towards uh, the end of the funding uh, period, we will also look up uh, at the new uh, emergencies, like, uh, for example, the migration crisis uh, and inclusiveness uh, in the former period as just one of the topics. Uh, and uh, this is what we are going to do. Uh, and then, of course, there will be so many outputs uh, that have to be, by default, uh, used somewhere. It's also part of our indicators. And uh, here uh, is also the novelty compared with the previous uh, periods. You really have to make sure that you involve the target groups and that you uh, actually uh, make the use uh, of uh, the results uh, of the project. So um, it's tough, uh, a tough business for everyone, but uh, we really uh, want you to uh, deal with that with uh, upgraded applications because also the ones that uh, did not have a chance to be approved uh, in the first call but are of good quality and could be upscaled, please uh, do so and try to find out some excellent ideas and work on quality and quality and that would be uh, the message. Thank you, Nadia. Maybe anything from the floor here? Maybe someone wants to run a second project pretty soon? Well, not that soon as we heard, but soon. Um, but maybe the next question is, um, is there any guideline or principle for selecting a local partnership in its various forms, including private partners or not? Um, how do you do it the best way? Well, uh, this is an, a question to which only the applicant knows best how to answer. It has to be relevant. Look at the selection criteria, the selection questions, and look at uh, uh, what is asked there. Your partnership has to be relevant for what you want to do. You have to have the right people doing the things that you want to do in your project proposal. Um, there are two ways to involve partnerships. One is, of course, the formal participation into the partnership of the project listed in the application form, and there of course, you cannot explode too much the number of partners because then you have to have a project which is manageable. That's why we give this recommendation 5 to 12. Uh, but there is another way, which is uh, with your involvement as, as target groups. Your local partners can be maybe best involved in the, as a beneficiaries of your project activities and outputs. And this is absolutely important and makes the difference between a good or a not good proposal, to have a clear linkage to the local partnerships. Because in this way, you can really 
have that your project re brings to results and to impacts in the territories. So that's why, it's in, that's why for example, we are different from, from research, pure research projects. In these kind of projects, you need to have this link to the end users of your results. You need to show already in your application form how you expect to involve local partnerships in a proper way. Then if it is public, private, at which level, at which governance level, it's really depending on your project. There are projects with different spins which have different uh, best partners, depending on really from what you want to do. Thank you, Luca. I think it was you mentioning that we have, or maybe Cristiano, we had like many, many excellent proposals and we couldn't still, even though we increased the budget, we couldn't fund them all. So here's a question. Um, if an application was submitted in the first call, is it possible for the lead applicant to ask for a detailed evaluation so as to improve the proposal? So is there this kind of like specific support maybe to those that failed? I wouldn't even say failed in the first call. So could they get a more detailed evaluation? Of course, but you have to keep also the time in mind because we have the call open now and we have a call closing on, on uh, 17th of May. As a general principle, whenever we close a call and we finish with the selection process, for those rejected, we always offer the opportunity to get more information also on the details. And very often, I think, also with the first call, we got many requests from, from rejected proposals to get understanding better what they were not, uh, in what they were not good in order to resubmit their proposals. Uh, now, it's a special time. We are opening the call today. So you heard that as from next week, we will offer individual consultations. So. I think the best way is to come already to the individual consultation with your idea, which is not a pre-assessment of the proposal, but just looking at your idea and having a feedback. And in this context, if it is a resubmission of a rejected project, you can also address questions in this context. But still, uh, it's time now to work on the proposals. Now it's time to look at uh, writing the new applications. Thank you, Luca. Christiana, they are not letting you away easily about the recommendations, you know. So the question is, if 30 months is recommended, in inverted commas, is there an actual fixed maximum duration? So do we have secretly in mind that there is a fixed duration, we just call it recommendation? Uh, this is how I understand the question. So <laughs> is 30 months a recommendation or is it like go for 30 months? <laughs> I, I think I just, uh, uh, this was also a very um, important discussion among, among the member states and the monitoring committee. And uh, I think we have to be kind of pragmatic. So the recommendation is also there due to the shortage of funds, uh, due to the uh, recommendation to have a, a bit smaller or resized project. However, we leave it open, so if you think that your uh, project uh, activities, outcomes, and uh, what you want to do need a longer time, and it is justified, then this will be taken into account. So, but there is a lot of experience also in uh, during the assessment to see, okay, uh, is this, can this project, does it really need that long? Because we have seen similar ones that can do similar uh, results in a shorter time. Or yes, we have seen that this topic addressed simply needs longer, maybe to conclude on a pilot action uh, based on whatever, you know, uh, some seasons or taking other aspects into account. Uh, therefore, we are not restricting it but you really need to bring uh, your justification for that. Thank you, Christiana. So, there's many more questions, but we also have a Q&A webinar coming up. So, uh, again, just some advertisement for those following us online, because here I think you're all quite content with your projects, not going to apply with us soon. So, um, maybe... <laughs> Maybe a good example that it's not us, not only the Joint Secretary that can answer questions. We have a very specific question. I'm curious whether anyone can answer this here because in my feeling this is more for the Hungarian contact point maybe. So question is, 
can those uh, partners that are currently excluded from EU funds for whatever reason, uh, some Hungarian universities, for example, is in the question, um, can they actually apply for the Interact second call? Can they actually get it get contracted in the future? I'm not sure we can answer this. Bella? Because I think we don't have to try necessarily, <laughs> because I think you saw we have all the National Info Days coming up. Um, so this is probably the, a very good question for the national contact point to check the eligibility in detail. So just a recommendation maybe also. Unless, Luca, Christian, you want to... No, I think it's a very, very... Just to show you how specific the questions can get here. Um, maybe a last one before last one. we... Yes, because we have I to think, keep the time as well, yeah. So a very simple one, um, I hope. When and where will the second call application package be available? Where do you get all the information you have been talking about? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the application package is available as from now, I would say. So from now you can connect to our website and uh, download our application. <laughs> so we have a little ceremony. <laughs> it has to be like that. But, 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 but. Um, I, th I think we need a bit more energy than this little thingy that Christian just... <laughs> you know. <laughs> maybe I can get the support of all of you. We are going into lunch break straight after. So maybe I can ask you to stand up, launch the call with us. <laughs> and maybe just... You remember this from school, maybe? So, all together for the new call. So, we will launch the new call now. Ready, steady, go! Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Please take your seats. <laughs> We have just instruction for you, but before I do this, I say bye bye. So, bye bye. Thank you very much for the energy. <laughs> Thank you for joining online. Have a nice day.